you might not have realized that this is actually where cork comes from. The process of harvesting the cork oak takes precision, years of practice, and a good ax. In the Alentejo region of Portugal, workers spend their summers delicately removing the outer layers of the trees by hand before sending them to be processed into something a little more recognizable. Natural cork has been used in winemaking for centuries and is still the stopper of choice for 89% of wine spectators top 100 wines. On today's episode, we take a look at how cork goes from bark to bottle. It all starts here. Portugal has the largest cork oak forest by area in the world. It takes around 15 years for a cork oak tree to grow its first layer, but it's harvested in cycles of nine years. And only from the third harvesting on, or 27 years later, the raw material called Amadea cork is ready for processing. Comecei com 15 anos, tenho 45, há cerca de 30 anos que faço extração de cortiça. A cortiça é feita neste período, no período do verão, é feita com, com machados, com, com parelhas, como a gente cá chama, que é dois homens, para se ajudarem um ao outro, com muito cuidado para não, para não dar cabo das árvores. É muito difícil, porque tem que se ter ciência para não dar cabo das árvores e para as árvores nunca se freiam. Portugal is the world leader not only in cork extraction, harvesting about 100,000 tons of it a year, but also in selling cork products. 2018 was an historical year for the cork industry. We crossed Portugal for the first time in our history, 1 billion euros in exports. Wine stoppers make up a majority of the market, representing 70% of total exports. Knowing that 40 million cork stoppers are produced daily in Portugal, it's very likely that when you are opening a wine bottle, the cork stopper is coming from Portugal. After a period of rest, the cork planks are ready for the first stage of the industrial process, the boiling. Raw cork is boiled for at least one hour to reduce its humidity, making it softer. The planks are trimmed to size and then punched to form the natural cork stoppers. Seven out of ten bottles of wine in the world choose a cork stopper. Our exports to the world have been growing in average of 4.5% over the last 10 years, which is a growth that is bigger than the wine industry, so it shows that we are not only taking part of the growth of the wine business as well as taking a market share uh, back to cork out from some competitors and artificial closures. Cork is a natural product. There are another kinds of stoppers, something like plastic or metal, but it's very important to use natural stoppers because it's more ecological and it's very good for aging our wine and uh, maintain better quality. We don't waste anything, even the small residues, the powder we have from the ratification from small parts of our production we use to produce energy. So this is probably one of the best examples in the world of what is our goal of sustainability, an example of circular economy where all the products we extract from the tree is used not only in cork stoppers but also in other applications from construction to automotive industry to aerospatial to sports, fashion clothes. We know the battle against single-use plastics that is happening all over the world. It's a real opportunity for cork because we need to change really the way the world is consuming, finding products that can be recyclable, that can be reused, that can be redesigned in other applications. Traditional cork stoppers are very popular with winemakers around the world, but more alternative methods for sealing a bottle are becoming mainstream. Master sommelier Mia Vandewater is here to discuss all the options and give us an expert look at the wine industry. So is cork the best way to close a bottle or what about all these other ways that we have? It really depends on your goal as the winemaker and when you're intending to have the bottle drunk. If it's something that's going to be consumed in the first couple of years, it it doesn't matter. And honestly, screw caps 
make life much easier when you're trying to go to the beach or have a picnic or any time you don't want to fuss with bringing a corkscrew somewhere. Um, that being said, if you're making wine that you're intending to age for 20 or 30 years, it's hard to improve on the cork. It is, it is nature's most exceptional natural stopper. And so most of us would rather see cork in the wines that we think are gonna age for the longest period of time. And is there a difference between actual real cork and the all like fake cork that I sometimes see that I believe is plastic? So there's a couple different things. So there's, there's plastic corks, which are just plastic, either extruded or made by injecting it into a mold. There's also agglomerated corks or technical corks, which are made by taking natural cork, grinding it up, you're able to remove impurities that way. You also have less waste, so they tend to be a little more affordable. And then they're reshaped into a cork shape. So it's natural cork, but it's not just punched out corks like uh, we normally think about. And then there's the highest quality, which is that punched out natural cork. They always, at the restaurant, they always give you wine mm -hmm. to taste. And it's always unclear to me the best way to realize I feel like I would just drink bad wine to not be embarrassed. Um, but one time the waiter smelled the cork and didn't even let me taste it and he said, oh, this wine is bad. It's tricky. So the reason that you're given the cork is so you can see if it looks correct, like this is a bottle of Bordeaux, the name of the chateau is printed on the cork itself. If you were to pull the cork and it were to say a totally different chateau, you might have some questions about mm -hmm. the provenance of your wine, right? Um, you're also given it to see if, like the condition of the cork in general, so this is a pretty young wine, um, you see that there's moisture on the end, so uh, it seems like it was stored well, um, but there isn't any additional moisture like seeping up the cork, which, which with an older wine can sometimes indicate some temperature fluctuations in storage. You can sometimes smell cork taint, which is um, basically chlorides that get into the cork and then can damage the experience of drinking the wine on the cork, but if you have like the cork is an inch and a half or so long. If you have TCA, which is the chemical, in one end of the cork and it hasn't made its way all the way down, sometimes you can smell it on the cork but it's not actually infecting the wine yet. So you always, you always make a decision off of the wine and not off of the cork. Oh, and is cork tape the only thing that can happen to a bottle of wine to make it go bad? No, so, so cork taint is, it's like a landmine because you can't tell from the outside and as a producer, like, you never know when it's gonna show up. And it is something that strikes like a bottle here or there. So uh, that cork taint is what makes the wine smell like wet dog or like moldy cardboard or sort of like like the basement of your house, mm, which is not, that does not, smell not good. delicious. This smells good, but the basement <laughs> of my house would not. And it also, um, it diminishes the overall aromatics of the wine. But especially if you're drinking a wine that is a little bit older and has been stored for a period of time, if you let the wine get too hot, it can matterize or, or sort of become cooked or port-like. Yeah, you can have heat damage or oxidation if the wine was stored like standing up for a long time and the cork got brittle and let too much air in and things like that. Join our Facebook group and help us keep the conversation going. And we'll see you tomorrow for another episode of Business Insider Today.